and, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Soren. I am the president of the MAP Alumni Association. Thank you to the, at this particular moment, 177 of you who have joined us today. Wow, this is gonna be um, a crazy, amazing, massive MAP meetup. Um, I'm just gonna do a very, very quick little uh, um, uh, kind of show and tell of things that you should know um, about how we're gonna use this period of time. So, uh, so first of all, let me just talk about what, um, what the agenda is. We're gonna have a fireside chat with Marty, um, Dr. Aaron Beck, Dr. Judy Beck, and maybe some other special guests. And that's gonna be probably the first 45 minutes or so um, of this call. Um, after that, we're gonna do a panel Q and A uh, where, um, where we will ask some of the questions that you've asked us already in the RSVP survey. And if there's other questions that you have as we go through, just feel free to put them into the chat and we'll be um, keeping an eye out. Uh, if we have time in the last probably third of this call, it lasts for 90 minutes in total, we'll try to do some breakouts and, uh, and have an opportunity for some more intimate conversations and then we will wrap up. Um, just some quick logistics. Uh, we are going to keep you on mute unless you are specifically talking just to make sure that this is um, as effective as possible. We also really encourage you to keep your cameras on. Um, if you go into gallery view, once we are done with the slides, it's really fun to just scroll through the pages and see the hundreds of mapsters who are on. Um, it's certainly a positive intervention just seeing your amazing spaces. Um, we would encourage you to use the chat to share ideas and to post questions. Um, if you do want to speak, we ask you to raise your hand within the chat function um, or, or, or within the Zoom function, you'll, you'll be able to do that. If you are asking questions, be practically wise. Make sure that uh, you keep your questions short so that we can make sure that the people answering them can, can have the most time to be able to answer them. Uh, and if you want, feel free to rename yourself so that uh, your map year or other affiliation um, is, uh, is visible to everybody who's here. Um, just a quick note of gratitude. Thank you, Louis Lero and Darlene for um, being our Zoom ninjas today. Uh, Jill Bell and Dana Fulweiler um, are gonna be reporters to make sure that we capture everything and summarize it today. Um, Robin Johnson and Jen Hausman have helped an enormous amount to synthesize all of the amazing information that you already posted in the RSVP. And I just wanna especially call out Meng Fu, our incredible chair of the MAP Alumni Social Committee who has been doing heroic efforts to make sure that all of these meetups happen. I will speak more about that soon, but, um, but I first wanna just throw it over to Marty so that you can just introduce the folks who are gonna be on the phone and, uh, and start the conversation. So I'm gonna stop okay. sharing my screen. Good. Well, welcome to uh, a historic session. I think this one, this is a session that uh, we can tell our grandchildren about. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to uh, have us start off with uh, Tim Beck. Uh, Tim and I have been meeting for lunch, oh, about once a month for the last 20 years. Uh, and I've now made it to 77 and Tim has made it to 98. Uh, and so we're going to have our lunch session today with uh, some 200 of, uh, of you. And uh, the session today will start off with Tim and with Judy Beck as well. Judy is the head of the Beck Institute. And we've got Karen Rivich and Judy Salzberg here. We've got Hal Urban here as well. So Tim and Judy will talk for a bit and then they'll take your questions and then uh, I'll talk for a bit. I have something new to say. This is the first time I've ever endorsed the smiley face and I'll talk a bit about that. So uh, without a, a further introduction, except to say that Tim uh, comes from uh, Aaron Beck's middle name, Temkin, but I've known him all my life as Tim. So Tim, it's a great pleasure to have you here at our uh, lunchtime meeting. So, first of all, I am probably happy that you see my smiley face <laughs> to be here and to talk uh, to this alumni association, plus a number of people from the Beck Institute 
and also my two assistants are here. Um, um, that's uh, Victoria and Molly. Uh, uh, I, I thought you might be interested, and Marty would be interested in this too, as to how I first met Marty. And this was in the basement of Joe Wolpe's house. <laughs> now, for those who don't remember Joe Wolpe, he was a pioneer, the pioneer in behavioral psychology. And at that time, I wanted to find out as much as I could about behavioral psychology. So I got myself invited. And Joe used to remark uh, that I was the most intelligent uh, uh, the most in, in, intelligent uh, of Freudian that he ever met. And so how I got the mark of a Freudian is because I went through the usual routines in uh, uh, psychoanalysis. And then I tried to apply the uh, theory of psychoanalysis to dreams. And I remember that I applied for admission to the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. And they turned me down because they felt that anybody who had to do research on psychoanalysis to prove that it was valid uh, obviously needed more psychoanalysis. So, so they recommended that I spend four more years on the couch. Uh, and that was enough of an impetus to uh, push me over to uh, uh, psychology. <laughs> At that time, uh, uh, when Joe Wolpe was meeting, I presented my material on masochistic dreams. And what I attempted to demonstrate with the aid of a psychology graduate student by the name of Marvin, uh, Marvin Ravage, um, was that uh, depressed people had more masochistic dreams than non-depressed people. And I presented this material. And then a young man with curly hair uh, got up and he said that this was very valid because I had one line for the 14 patients uh, who had masochistic dreams in the depressive condition. And then there were 14 match controls who were not depressed. And these two lines never overlapped. And uh, I asked for this person's name uh, and I found out uh, that uh, he was none other than the person who founded positive psychology. Uh, and since that time, I have tried to keep up contact with Marty Seligman, who was a graduate student at that time in the Department of Psychology. And it's hard to believe that uh, how many decades have passed since then. And then Marty went to Cornell. And as you know, Cornell went through a, a number of big upsets, uh, well, mostly of a political nature. And I suspected that Marty might be vulnerable to being recruited. So I talked to, to our ch chairman, uh, Mickey Stunkin, and we arranged to have Marty come down as a, uh, uh, I think as a, just an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, in the Department of Psychiatry. And then eventually he merged over to psychology. Uh, the Department of Psychology in those days had a policy of not hiring anybody who had been graduated from that program. 
because the program was so good uh, that uh, any graduate uh, would be sure to go to Harvard or some other place. And uh, ever since then, Marty and I have kept up our contact. And then about 20 years ago, uh, we started meeting on a monthly basis. And I, I found that very rewarding. So that's the story. Marty, do you wanna do you wanna kick off with uh, with any with any questions for Dr. Beck? Marty, it's uh, can you hear me? Oh, it's great to hear about it. This was a uh, uh, fifty two years ago, fifty four years ago when the meetings at uh, Joe Wolpe's house took place, but I thought it was the living room in my, uh, and not the basement. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was my tribute to the unconscious. <laughs> well, Tim was my teacher then, and he is my teacher now. And uh, I think he and Judy have uh, some wisdom to share with you about anxiety and depression particularly during uh, this uh, pandemic. And so uh, uh, let's turn it back over to Tim and Judy uh, to, to share some of their thinking about what's going on now and what we should be doing. So anyhow, I reviewed some of the questions, about half a dozen of the questions. And there was one question that I double starred that was of particular interest to me. Anyhow, this question had to do with what does uh, positive psychology have to contribute to cognitive therapy? And uh, this is the first time I have a platform or a speech I want to make. And so for a long time, I've been studying psychology not as a student, not as a formal student, but as an outsider, because I never really took a course in psychology. And so I studied experimental psychology and biological psychology and cognitive psychology and personality and um, evolutionary psychology. And I came to the conclusion that each of these uh, approaches is correct, but it's also wrong. And what's wrong about each approach is that it takes up just a small segment of the individual. And the individual is a whole person. Uh, oh, and, and incidentally, uh, uh, in therapy, we also draw on the uh, conclusions of the Enlightenment, uh, which uh, draws on, uh, which applies to humanistic psychology. So, in our approach to human beings, we have to think of the person as a unit. Uh, and, and while it is possible, to look at it in terms, look at the person in terms of the biology or the psychology or the evolutionary antecedents and so on. You have to mold them all together and you have to look at the individual as a person who uh, is a composite of everything. And that's what's like where positive psychology molds with uh, uh, the negative psychology of cognitive therapy. And this is one of the big faults of cognitive therapy, which we have tried to remedy in the past 10 years. And that is that cognitive therapy was based mostly on the errors that individual make in their thinking. And incidentally, all their thinking is not wrong. In fact, it's only a small proportion of the thinking 
because for the most part, even if we are psychotic, for the most part, we go about our affairs in a perfectly rational, reasonable, realistic way. But there are certain situations in which we have errors in our thinking. And uh, being influenced by humanistic psychology, I wanted to apply the rules of the Enlightenment to, uh, to these kind of errors that people make. And uh, the, uh, re the uh, techniques we use uh, were the techniques of reasonable, uh, of reason and rationality and experimentation. And so I drew on a little bit of cognitive psychology and formulating my uh, thesis. And I drew heavily on experimental psychology and in, uh, in the approach. But uh, about 10 years ago, we started working with hospitalized psychotic patients. And I realized that uh, the cognitive psychology I was using really missed the boat. And uh, what we needed to do with our psychotic patients is to look at the positive aspects. And we found that when we got a patient who was very obsessed with his delusions and hallucinations and got him to talk about something that was meaningful to him and got him to uh, do things that were meaningful uh, to him, uh, that uh, the delusions and hallucinations receded into the background. And so we tried to activate the humanistic part of his psychology. And we did this through trying to provide opportunities for him to engage in altruistic activities, helping other people was extremely important, uh, or other kinds of meaningful activities. And these then had the result of reversing the extremely negative uh, self-concept to a positive self-concept. And when they had the positive self-concept, their negative voices tended to recede into the background and they no longer uh, had the grandiose uh, 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 delusions uh, that they had. And this brought me to the point where I realized that up till now, up till 10 years ago, I had missed the boat in segregating each uh, approach to psychology into a unit by itself. And I started to mold everything together. And I think that I now have a much more humanistic and holistic view of the person. And that this is the basis for therapy now. Well, I'd like to, Judy has observed this transition in, in my thinking, and I'd love to hear her take on it and also Marty's. So I've, I've really uh, shifted in my treatment of clients as a result of um, this kind of revolution that my dad and his colleagues who were at Penn, who are now at the Beck Institute, have made. Uh, so there's a, I have a different approach to um, clients now. This is uh, Paul Grant and Ellen Inverso and their team who work primarily with hospitalized individuals who are diagnosed with serious mental health conditions, um, now head up um, our program for um, what's called recovery-oriented cognitive therapy. And um, I've been translating that into um, how do you uh, might approach clients who are outpatients who are relatively much more highly functioning than the 
uh, people they've been working with who may have been hospitalized for the last 15 or 20 or 25 years. So I'd just like to say a few um, remarks about that. So more, so I had been a, um, approaching this shift for a long time. I didn't really have an organizing principle for it until I started really studying more about this um, recovery orientation. But one of the first things that we start with now with clients, or do more of, we've always done some, but do a lot more of, is talking about their values, what's really important to them in life. And then finding out what are their aspirations? How do they really want their lives to be? How do they want to be different as a result of treatment? And then at uh, every session, we've been putting much more of the focus on the positive. So while we still keep track of symptoms, we don't pay too much attention to symptoms because that's the negative bias. But um, we start off sessions by saying, what's, what is your sense of well-being this week? Say on a zero to 10 scale and then compare it to previous weeks. Um, and we find out from the client, instead of saying, what problem do you want to work on uh, when we set the agenda, we tend to say, what's your goal? Or what's your goal for today's session? Or what's your goal for the coming week? And so it's more positively oriented. Um, and so the agenda items tend to be goals, which are just the flip side of problems. So the problem is that I'm terribly anxious about the COVID-19 crisis, a, a client might say. And so the goal would to have their sense of well-being. And as we um, are talking about the goals, we talk about some specific steps the client could take this week to achieve the goal. And then we start talking about what could get in the way of achieving the goal. So perhaps the, the goal might be to focus my attention when I'm with my children on things that they're interested in and not be so bombarded by negative thoughts um, uh, that are fairly catastrophic in mind about the future. So I might teach the clients certain mindfulness techniques or other techniques. It, in um, identifying these challenges, we're looking for automatic thoughts that could get in the way. We're looking for practical problems that might need to be solved. And we're also looking for some skill deficits that the client might have. So we're using all of the same CBT kinds of techniques but in the service of what's coming up in the coming week, as opposed to looking back and talking about the problems of the past week. Now, oftentimes the problems of the past week are going to show up as um, impediments or challenges to being able to take the steps that they wanna take this coming week. So that we do carry that forth in that way, but it's a much more um, forward thinking way. And I just like to give you an example with a client. I had a client who had been in a different kind of therapy for 20 years, actually with the same therapist the whole time. And I think the therapy had helped her in some respects, but she was really very held back in life. She was just plagued with thoughts about how people in her past had misused her, had ill-treated her, hadn't respected her and so forth. And she was just mired in this kind of negative thinking. She came in one session and I, and I said, what's your goal for today's session? And she put her head down. She, she was thinking for a little bit. And she said, well, I guess I have to be honest with you about the terrible pain that I've experienced in my life. And I said, oh, well, that does sound very important. But can I ask you this question? How would you like to feel when you come in next week? And she said, well, I'd, I'd like to feel happier. I said, oh, that's great. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me write that down. How else would you like to feel? Well, I like to feel like I accomplished something. Oh, that's another great one. Let me write that down. Uh, how else would you want to feel? Well, I guess I want to feel more in control. Oh, very good. And would you want to feel more uh, competent? Oh, yes. Um, would you like to feel more self-confident? Oh, yes. So would it be all right if we could now talk about just one step you could take this week that might move you in the direction of how you want to be feeling next week? So that's kind of in contrast to what I might have done in the past um, to find out she, what bothered her the most about um, her history, what was on her mind the most, and 
probably trying to do some cognitive restructuring about what went on. Um, so that's the a, a shift toward the positive that um, we've been, that all of our therapists, both the recovery-oriented ones and our kind of regular expert CBT therapists, I see Norman Cotterell is, is uh, here today too, um, have been making is this emphasis on uh, values and on aspirations and on um, seeing the positive in life instead of focusing on the negative. Do you mind if I if I jump in quickly with a with a question? We've had a lot of people in the in the chat. First of all, just saying first of all how thrilled they are to be able to see both of you embracing this notion of the positive, but also a turn to um, a very solution focused, goal oriented way of thinking about about therapy. So um, lots of applause in the chat um, and excitement for that. One one specific question. Um, that we have, uh, we've heard a lot, especially in the RSVPs, was about just this period of time that we're in right now where there's so much fear and anxiety um, that is in many ways very legitimate fear and anxiety about what's going on. And so a question that from both of your perspectives, what might be the single most impactful intervention um, those within this community might be able to offer to people to just grapple with some of that fear and anxiety for people who are in their lives. So Julie can tackle the fear and anxiety uh, aspect. I have a general recommendation that I make to people, and that's to turn adversity into uh, an opportunity. Um, and this is an unusual opportunity to reset your priorities. And I uh, think of a, a pie chart and have the people talk out, uh, talk up in the ideal world under the ideal circumstances, how they would like to spend their time and how they would like to be invested into. And, uh, it's interesting how the professionals, particularly who are really obsessed with getting books out or writing papers or seeing more patients or whatever, how they take to this. Um, and among the priorities would be spending more time with your family, uh, be a good role model for your children and grandchildren and have them call their grandfather and grandmother occasionally and, uh, and do a lot of good things, uh, good things for the community and good things for other people that they always wanted to do. And by resetting the priorities, they stimulate this kind of positive feeling, which may be a more enduring thing than just the smiley face that Marty was talking about. Uh, if they can get first get a smiley face and then uh, an enduring happy mood after that. That sounds good to me. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you about one technique. I'd like to tell you about 50 different things that people can do, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say one that people might or might not be familiar with. Uh, and, and by the way, the, this new approach um, in CBT is what I've just finished writing about, and, and it's going to be in the third edition of CBT Basics and Beyond, which comes out in the fall, along with this technique. Uh, one book, of the problems that... should well, really be a new book because oh. there's so much stuff that's new in it that pe people might think the third edition is just going to be a remake of the second yeah. edition. And there's also um, going to be a new book out on uh, recovery-oriented cognitive therapy by um, uh, Paul Grant and Ellen Inverso and other authors, including my dad, that's coming out probably at the late summer, early fall, that talks about how to really help people with serious mental health conditions. Anyway, here's the technique, or uh, here's the rationale. Um, people are so wrapped up in the moment how can I keep myself safe right now? Or how can I keep my family safe um, 
And then also thinking about the next few months. And it's, it is very hard to live with uncertainty. I think for most people, uh, other people who are anxiety prone, it's really hard to live with uncertainty. And there is so much uncertainty, realistic uncertainty for all of us. Um, but they can be bombarded by these thoughts over and over and over again. So what I do is to, to again, if I haven't done it recently, would go back and ask um, people, and my dad was talking about this a moment ago too, about what's really important to them in life. What, what are their highest values? And then I ask them to imagine a day, say five years into the future. So we've had the vaccine for four years. Uh, we've had no more pandemics because we've learned from this one. Um, things have gotten back to some new normal, new normalcy, say for at least three and a half years or so. So it's five years into the future. We've had this new normal for the last three and a half years. And I ask them to imagine in their mind's eye as I ask them these questions, where would you like to imagine that you wake up? Is it where you are now? Is it in the same city? Is it in a different place? Um, whom do you want to imagine is in your apartment or in your house with you when you wake up? How do you want to imagine you're going to be feeling when you wake up? What do you want to be thinking when you wake up? What would you do first? Uh, the first thing when you got out of bed? What would you like to see yourself doing next? What would you like to see yourself doing next? And I have them paint a picture for themselves, a realistic picture of what life might be like five years from now, from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep. And we make sure, uh, I make sure to ask questions that will embody their values. So, you know, you've said how important music is a part of your life. How would you like to imagine that you might um, have music in your life in this one day five years from now? Or you've said it's so important for you to be able to help other people. What could you inject into your day that would, that would make you feel good about helping others? And so when you um, get people to imagine, instead of just talk, when people talk, um, they're usually their rational mind is turned on. When they uh, imagine their gut level sense or that emotional level sense is turned on. And when you do a technique like imagine yourself five years in the future, if someone can't, they, they go to 10 years in the future, if they still don't think the world's gonna be back to a new normal. Um, when they imagine it, then uh, it hits them at the emotional level. And you can see as you're asking questions and helping them go through the day that they're asking affect lifts. And it's so important. Uh, and I think he was talking about this. I can't remember whether it was when you were all tuned in or before that. But it's very important to have our clients experience positive emotion right in every session itself. There's, um, there's very active, lots of activity in our chat. Um, lots of lots of connection to everything that you're both talking about. And especially this question of uh, do wh what 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 kind of life would you like to be able to have when all of this is done? Uh, Emma Judge says um, that apparently there's some new data in the UK that um, in a survey only nine percent of people who responded to this survey want to return to their life as it was before, which of course raises really big questions of what do they want to change and how they can be supported and how that forces us to take us back to, to what a new normal might be. So I think all the questions you're asking um, are fascinating. Uh, Marty, do you have any questions that you wanna ask of, uh, of Dr. Beck? No, I really wanna turn it over to the uh, 220 of us who are watching. Uh, <laughs> I get plenty of opportunity to talk to Tim. Uh, this is special for the rest of you. Well, I think that there's, um, I'll just, I'll start again from, uh, from some of the questions that have been posed before this session. So, um, so another question that I know that, um, that people were very keen to be able to hear about is, um, is in relation to, I'll stick with the, I'll stick with the context of the pandemic, in relation to specific populations. 
Um, and some of the populations that uh, the people described in the questions were uh, essential workers or, um, or isolated elders um, or teens who might be feeling really isolated right now. Um, are there specific suggestions that you have to support and help any of those particular populations? Uh, you read? Uh, sure. So, well, probably the most important is uh, social connection. And, and I should really say meaningful social connection. Um, so one of the things that I did, I have a son with special needs who lives alone in his own apartment uh, and um, is feeling really isolated. And since both my husband and I uh, did uh, catch uh, COVID, COVID-19, we, we um, couldn't be with him. So one of the things that I did was to email um, many, many of our relatives on both sides of the family, extended family, and ask them to set up uh, FaceTime calls with my son. And that made a huge difference. And they started to do it on a regular basis. So he would know that twice a week he was going to talk to his great aunt and uh, my first cousin, for example. That's one of, one of his favorite phone calls. But uh, so helping people with meaningful social connection, I think, is probably one of the most important. That's a wonderful suggestion, by the way. I didn't realize that you had done that. Yeah. Oh, Do you have other ideas? You want me to say anything else? Sure. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, with, with our patient population who are inpatients, we have uh, in a typical day when we walk into the day room, they don't be lying on a couch uh, listening to voices. Uh, or in the worst case, they'd be um, walking around naked. And what's interesting is how they get transformed overnight, uh, could get transformed in a couple of minutes if you have them doing something that fits into their deepest desires, which happened to be inactive at the time. And so, we encourage sociality, uh, and we find that this has a transforming uh, uh, effect on them. Now, well, what do you do when you uh, are in a position where the people have to be quarantined and they do not have any uh, interpersonal connections? And so, uh, as it happens, for reasons I don't quite understand. These people do not have computers, but they do have telephones. And, uh, and what we do is we encourage them to call up or, or, or we encourage their families to call them. And we encourage their children and grandchildren and necessary the great grandchildren so they'll keep up some social connection and there was one other thing I wanted to add. Uh, it sounds as though there's still gooding uh, that uh, Judy and I are advocating uh, is an antidote to the negative thinking. And it actually turns out to be true uh, that we did some research and we found that when people get better, they score higher on the optimism test and lower on the pessimism aspects of the hopelessness scale. And uh, they also show more positive thinking uh, as opposed to the negative thinking. And uh, it seems to me uh, that we'll, we'll have to test this out, that there's a kind of a seesaw. And so, uh, when uh, the positive thinking gets activated, the negative thinking goes down. So get, to come back to the question of the sociality, any way in which you can encourage sociality uh, in these people through telephones or through the internet or 
uh, through correspondence, writing to one another, uh, the, the more that they're going to think positively and the less they'll think negatively. Um, this, this gives me uh, a good uh, uh, transition to chime in with what I've been thinking uh, uh, is so important uh, that positive psychology and cognitive therapy might teach us about this time. Uh, uh, as for sociality, um, the um, uh, gallery view, so I have a gallery view of, of more than 200 of you. And so uh, this for me, uh, the question, I ask myself the question, uh, is this heaven? I'm looking at so many people that I love and I like, and uh, uh, the answer is uh, no, it's Zoom. It's not heaven, but it, it's very close for sociality for me. Uh, and uh, let me, so what I've heard today uh, from Tim and Judy and from the chat is uh, one, during this uh, epidemic, uh, there's a chance to ask ourselves what is really important in our lives to change our priorities and to ask us what kind of a future do we want. Uh, second thing that I'm hearing is the importance of sociality. And this is a, itself a wonderful example for me. Uh, a third thing is kindness. This is an opportunity uh, f to do kindnesses for many people. Uh, and uh, now I, I want to turn to uh, a new thing that I'm thinking. And this was set off by uh, Hal Urban, who's here with us. So about three days ago, uh, Hal's writing a book about positivity. I hadn't met him before. And he asked me the question, uh, uh, what, good it, what good it might do to bombard yourself with good news and with positive moments now? And I had to step back when he asked me that because uh, I've been so turned off by the smiley face over the years that the notion of having a lot of positive moments didn't seem very meaningful to me compared to optimism and sociality and doing a kindness. Um, but uh, sitting at home now for six weeks with, with four of my kids, my wife and uh, uh, four dogs, uh, and listening to moments of bitching and moaning versus moments of positivity um, has really gotten me thinking about Hal's question. Now, the first thing to acknowledge um, is it's very difficult during times like this to uh, uh, spontaneously generate uh, positive thoughts. And so, uh, importantly, this is difficult what, because what I'm going to be suggesting is maximizing positive moments realizing how difficult it is. But importantly, um, I, I'm reminded of, of uh, the story of, of psychiatric facilities at the Blitz in 1940. So many of you probably know that when the Blitz began, uh, the British psychiatric establishment um, predicted there would be 3 million psychiatric casualties. And they ringed, they I'm not, ringed is probably the right word, London with psychiatric emergency facilities when the Blitz began. Uh, Tim, do, were you about to say something? No, I'm saying you're accurate in the use of the term ring. They, they did have facilities uh, surrounding London, but go ahead. Yeah. So the surprising thing was after three months, they closed up because there were no psychiatric casualties. Very interesting about wartime and perhaps about a pandemic that people start marshalling other resources. In the case of the Blitz, it was having a common external enemy. Uh, in the case of a pandemic, we're just finding out now. So let me suggest a resource that we should be doing during the pandemic. And it's the answer to Hal's question about what good is it 
not to bitch and moan, but rather to bombard yourself with as many opportunities for positive moments. Uh, what good do positive moments do? And uh, so here was my answer to Hal, and Hal may want to chime in as well. So first, positive moments are, produce good vagal tone, lots of parasympathetic relaxing activity, uh, uh, activity that antagonizes anxiety, depression, and anger. Uh, from Barb Fredrickson's work, we know that bursts of positive films uh, block and shorten uh, negative ruminations. Positive moments lead to more zest. Uh, uh, positive emotion helps in getting us started doing things. And I, last week I talked about Sheldon Cohn's work on positive affectivity as a, a possible preventive of uh, viral infection. In, uh, and finally, uh, positive moments are fun. So my recommendation during the pandemic is the smiley face. Uh, we bought a new puppy. Uh, the puppy's 12 weeks old now. There are lots of things one can do when one is tempted to bitch and moan to conjure up positive emotions. So my feeling, Tim and Judy, right now is that in the next uh, uh, four weeks, 12 weeks of isolation, each of us should find ways to maximize the amount of positive emotion we have in our lives. When this ends, and as Lincoln said, this too will pass, that's when resilience and optimism are going to matter for rebuilding. So Hal, I wanted to say I'm, I'm grateful to you for uh, making me think about the smiley face again and about the importance of P in PERMA. So I wonder, Hal, if you might say a few words about your thinking about a positive emotion. Yeah, I, I first of all, let me say I'm, I'm really excited and, and honored to be a part of all this. It came about by uh, me uh, asking Marty if he would answer a question because I'm writing a book and I want to have a voice of authority. And the book is actually about uh, not so much just positive moments, but positive information going into your brain. The, the working title of the book is The Good News Effect, and then the subtitle is something along the line of, of um, uh, what, what putting positive information in your mind does, does for you. And so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what the whole thing is about. And I wanted to get a, a few people who, who are well known to tell me what do they see as the benefits of pot, putting positive information in, into your brain. I, Many, many years ago, more than 30 years ago, I heard a speaker who was not a psychologist, but he said, you are what you are because of what goes into your mind. And we talk a lot about positive thinking and doing positive things and positive moments, but there isn't a real lot of information out there about making it a daily habit to put positive information into your, into your mind. And I have been doing that for many years. It kind of started accidentally. I was a teacher and we used to do uh, current events every day and all the, all the kids said, God, the news is bad all the time. All it is is bad news. And, and so we decided to start every class with sharing good news just to get class off to a good start. And once the kids got into it, and I did this with adults too. I was a adjunct professor at the University of San Francisco for 36 years and I did it with them too. And they just loved it. I said, what's going what's going good in your life? And they love talking about it. They love sharing it. It rubbed off on other people. And it was phenomenal. And I've had my former students, some of them now in their 60s, who have been asking me for years, you know, you've written other books, when are you going to write about good news? And so finally, I finally I did it. So again, the idea is uh, input the positive, you know, put positive things. You don't have to be around people. You can go to the internet and you can find all kinds of good news. And that's why I think people like... Uh, um, the woman down in Southern California, her name is Jerry, I think, uh, Jerry weiss Corbley, and she started the Good News Network, and, and uh, Ariana Huffington has, the Huff Post has a good news thing, and so uh, that, that's kind of a long answer, but anyway, thanks, Marty, I really appreciate being with you. I'd like to jump in here. 
and, uh, and add to what you just said, Al. And it's not just the good things that happen to you, but what is the meaning of these good things? That's very important to nail down the meanings of things, particularly with our clients. So to give you an example of what I mean, uh, so we ask our patients uh, uh, what they would like to have uh, in their life uh, when they get out of the hospital and they rejoin their families and the community and so on. What are their real aspirations? And so one patient said, well, his real aspiration is to be a great playwriter. And, uh, and uh, the therapist then said, well, what's good about being a good playwright? He said, well, there are things that you can do that will entertain people. Uh, you'll be doing something worthwhile. Other people will respect you, will be creative. And he listed a dozen things that were meaningful about being a great, great playwright. But it was obvious uh, to the therapist that he was never gonna be a great playwright. So the, the therapist said, well, that would be uh, an ultimate thing, but here you would like to entertain people, you'd like to be creative, you'd like to do something worthwhile, you'd like to be respected by other people, uh, you'd like to bring enjoyment into their lives. What could you do in the meantime uh, that would satisfy all those meanings? And the person said, well, I suppose I could be a stagehand. And he did get a position as a stagehand. And uh, in this position, uh, he was asked, what, 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 what are the feelings you have about being a good stagehand. And he said, well, it makes people happy. Uh, it makes me happy. I'm entertaining people. I'm worthwhile. I'm creative and so on. And so it was the meaning of the event rather than the event itself that was yeah. so important. There, I'll, um, from, I'll... what, what, from what Tim says, it occurs to me there is a gift that I would like to get from some of you and may, maybe share with others. And that is, I wonder if some of you who I know so well could make a series of YouTube clips, great music, great moments, uh, a series, see if you can design a set of YouTube clips that bring many positive moments to others. I'd like to have that and start going through it. Uh. Mm. There's been some some really wonderful comments uh, all throughout the chat as you have been describing all of this that I'll just recap some of. So 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 one of the one of the things that especially folks within Europe have been telling us on the call is just how how much of a positive um, emotion burst the clapping um, at 8 p.m. every night is for all of the healthcare workers um, uh, within the community, specifically in the UK, in Spain, in Italy, uh, and several and several other places. I know that in New York, they've been starting to do it too. Um, and, and that burst of positivity, I think, um, connected to the meaning as you've just described, Dr. Beck, um, and, and especially to that kind of pro-social connection probably is important too. There's lots of other people who have talked about um, the, the positive news that they're starting to see, whether it's uh, the BBC ending broadcasts with good news. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for that call out. Um, people uh, have specifically called out Henry Edwards, your, your book on kind of the good news and good things. Um, uh, New York Times publishing articles on, on kind of good news reports. Um, so lots of different places where they are seeing good news and, um, and yeah, there's <laughs> so many comments. It's too it's too hard to be able to pick, but we'll we'll make sure that we summarize some of them too. Lots of love around this notion of positive portfolios and finding um, finding different ways to be able to share positive portfolios in uh, in different ways. 
So um, I, uh, I want to, I want to probably shift the conversation a little bit and create an opportunity for us to have more intimate conversations um, in the last half of an hour. Um, before I do, um, Dr. Beck, is there anything, any last words that you'd like to give to the group? Yeah, so I'm glad to have this audience because one of the misconceptions about cognitive therapy that I've heard for the last 60 years is that cognitive therapy tends to be artificial, that it is not emotional, uh, it's not positive, and uh, it neglects the doctor-patient relationship or, or the interpersonal relationship uh, with the client. And I want to go on record as saying all those things are wrong. And uh, this idea that cognitive therapy is just a manualized set of techniques is a total misrepresentation of what we do. And uh, I, I think what we do does incorporate much of the positive and uh, it's going to incorporate even more as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beck. Judy, Dr. Judy Beck, do you want to say anything, any last words from, from your perspective? Yes, yeah, just to pick up from what Marty was saying, I think it's really important for everybody, whether there is a, a pandemic or not, every day of his or her life is to train themselves to pay attention to the small positive moments during the day. Our attention often is drawn to the negative, and perhaps that had a survival um, purpose back when we were cavemen. So I think it takes a concerted effort to wear a different set of glasses throughout your day and uh, recognize, it's not enough to have positive moments, you have to recognize that they're positive and then you have to remember them in some way. So I tell everybody I know to get a, um, an online diary app, there's one that I particularly like, where you can take um, pictures and also have texts, um, you know, uh, write in texts and uh, keep track of these positive moments that you have every day. And then you have this photographic record as well as a written record um, when you need to go back and perhaps re-experience some of those positive moments because your current moment is not that great. Judy, what's the name of that app? That one, there probably are a lot of them. And when I got it years ago, it was free. So I don't know if it still is. It's day one, D-A-Y and a separate word, O-N-E. Hmm. Thank you. We've had a couple of different Mapsters too, who've been telling us about at various apps that they are creating. Um, Ming, I know that you've been developing an app that uh, that basically uses Bixby, um, which is the Samsung version of Siri. And I think you've possibly also been de developing a Siri version one too, that gives people actually CBT-like prompts um, uh, for people on an automatic uh, uh, kind of, um, automatic period of time throughout the day. I know that there's um, at least one other app too that was described, which we'll make sure that we um, that we promote. There are so many more questions. There are so many more questions that um, that that, uh, that we don't have time to answer. But um, what uh, what Dr. Beck has kind of very generously agreed is that if we send him a list of our top our top questions, um, he'll try to maybe uh, answer some of them um, on his own time as well, and we can make sure we get that back to the community. So, um, so that's, I think, one of the things that we can do 